I, uh, I'm uh, tempted to also mention that, like Martin Schulz, I wanted to be a professional soccer player when I was younger, but, but I will resist that temptation. Um, so, I'm told I'm the only person with slides. That's what you would expect from somebody coming out of from the fund. I'm also trying to sort of go through the door, walk through the door, right with the answer to the main question. When asked whether it's growth for jobs or jobs for growth, I think it's fair to say that growth for jobs is the short answer to what admittedly is a complicated issue. If an economy is growing healthily, we will see that uh, employers will, will hire people, we will have rising wages, uh, we'll have confidence and access to credit for investment, and ultimately this is what creates jobs in a lasting way. Putting more people to work, of course, supports growth. There's this feedback loop, um, um, but this is um, th this is not at the heart, I think, of, of the issue. What is at the heart of the issue is that the growth that we need to create uh, jobs is extremely hard to come by, and I would argue that this is, at the current juncture, um, our main issue. So let's start with the facts. This is an extremely dismal picture. You've seen it many times. You see the euro area average unemployment rates for overall uh, um, and for the youth um, increasing dramatically, and you see the distribution around it. A 25% increase or Spain um, total unemployment is way too high. And 50% youth unemployment is incredibly high uh, in the same countries. This is a painful and this is a non-acceptable situation. The question is, what is behind it? I think to a large degree, we all agree that this has to do with a lack of growth. The deep shock of the Great Recession is behind much of this. The economists talk about Opun's law. That law is in place. It says that if growth is low, there will be a change in unemployment in the wrong direction. And this change has affected most of Europe. Now, if you look at the, um, at the picture here, that is the level of GDP in different, in different economies, uh, another fact uh, comes to mind, which is that the level of growth has been awfully low for an extended period of time. Not only was there the crisis, but we also had a situation where growth has not returned, and as we already heard, um, for most of the euro area countries, indeed for the average, GDP has yet to return to the levels of 2007, an achievement that other economies, large economies, um, um, have already um, behind them. Now, the question is, um, what is behind it? What makes this recession so long? It has to do with the fact that um, uh, many of the households, many of the corporations, many of the banks have come out of the crisis with a lot of debt. This is a picture where you can see the build-up of debt in uh, the household sector for many economies, and you can see the decline. As debt to GDP declines, that means there's less investment, there's less consumption than otherwise uh, there would be. It's this twin occurrence of a recession and of deleveraging that makes the aftermath of a crisis like this one so painful and so long. And uh, with this, um, I think, um, we also have sort of uh, most of the problems described um, in the in, um, in our hands. So what um, are we to do? I think we have at least a short-term and a medium-term problem, and that's what we just saw. That would be a misfortune enough, but uh, this goes unfortunately further than that. There are also, I think, um, issues that we usually uh, associate with structural problems in the economy. Uh, that we have to take care of. Now, I wouldn't go as far and say that there's a secular stagnation ahead, but there are these issues we have to deal with them. Um, and I will talk about this towards the end of my 15 minutes. Let me start with reminding you about the uh, policy options that we have in the short and the medium term. Now, you've heard the fund call for uh, support of monetary policies, and I'm happy to repeat this. Um, we support the very proactive stand taken by the ECB in, um, in recent months, and we welcome the um, willingness of the ECB to use additional unconventional measures if needed and if we don't get closer to the price stability goal. Fiscal policy we find to be, at the aggregate level, broadly balancing uh, growth and sustainability concerns. In case of a large negative shock to growth, however, additional consolidation beyond the current plans should be avoided. 
And I think uh, there is a good case to let automatic stabilizers work to the fullest using the flexibility of the European fiscal framework. But I think more can be done to show up the recovery in what I mentioned uh, as the medium term. If you look at these uh, figures here, you see private investment in the euro area's share of GDP, that's the blue line um, over there. You see that rapid, dramatic decrease in investment since the crisis has hit. So the question is, what is behind it? I think um, we understand that this has to do with um, financial fragmentation, especially in some of the harder hit um, areas of the euro area. It means high capital costs for corporations. It means less credit access for corporations. This means less investment. The ECB's comprehensive assessment of bank balance sheets should be helpful in this regard because it should bring clarity and help the banks um, to accelerate credit supply. Another very welcome initiative coming out of Frankfurt here is the ECB's ABS loan level initiative, um, which should help develop capital markets in the euro area and ultimately help investment. Now, when it comes to growth, both in the short term and both in the medium term, there's also a reason to think and to talk about public investment. Um, as you know, uh, there's a long time trend in global um, economies, advanced economies, that has seen the level of the public capital stock declining um, over a couple of years. The last, um, in, in behind this um, is, as well in the euro area, essentially a decline, a secular decline in the level of public investment. The red line measured on the right side of this figure here gives you the share of public investment in GDP, both in nominal terms for the last uh, 30 years or so, 25 years or so. This is on a downward path. Now, what is behind this decline depends and differs from country to country. Um, and, you know, I, we don't have the time to talk about a lot here, but we can give you examples. The Germany team of the IMF has looked as an example at the need for infrastructure investment in Germany, and it has identified backlogs, uh, you know, beyond the upkeep of bridges and roadways, also in schools and kindergarten um, investment. So there is room for, um, for, for things that will ultimately help growth. The question is how to pay for it. While Germany has fiscal space to finance some of these investments, other countries don't. One solution discussed by the fund previously would be to improve the ability of the European Union to fund public infrastructure investment, including cross-border networks of various sorts. This could be done in the form of public-private um, uh, partnerships and within the existing framework. President Juncker's recent proposal uh, points in this direction, and it will be interesting to see some of the details involved, including on the financing. This brings me to the final part of this uh, short presentation, which has to do with the longer term. Let me start again with a simple question. Do we think that addressing just the short and the medium term issues um, for growth will be enough to give us sustainable growth that will get, give us lasting gains for, um, and also in terms of jobs? And I think uh, the, the, the bland answer here is no. I think we need to improve the way uh, the uh, goods markets, the services markets, and the labor markets are performing. This is not a new issue, but it's a crucial issue, including for Europe. I will show you this picture here, which on the one side down there shows you where countries were in the euro area before the crisis hit in terms of their youth unemployment. The further to the right you are, the less um, um, uh, uh, good the situation was. And then there's the increase in unemployment since the crisis. And what you see is a little bit of a positive link. If you tended to have high youth unemployment before the crisis, you also tended to have a particular painful increase in youth unemployment. Okay? So there's, there's an issue here which points, broadly speaking, to the idea that, that there is something underlying um, the, the labor market performance, but not just labor market performance, that needs um, attention. And if you look at particular countries like Spain, Spain wasn't doing particularly well compared to the euro average. Indeed, it was falling below it in 2007. And that was after an extended period of, of a booming construction sector, of, of, of tremendous growth. 
if, however, you do not end up sort of at the top um, of, of this table, then probably there are issues that we need to worry about. So what can be done? What are the issues that we have to worry about? Let's stay with you with unemployment, but I think, because I think that's particularly important. So we have ongoing research um, on these issues and other issues at the fund, and one of the results that we have there is that the entry-level wages um, of young people as they enter the labor market can be a factor for youth unemployment. High wages at the entry level, even regulated one, are not a bad thing per se. Absolutely not. But they can be problematic in circumstances where they don't allow young people to start jobs and where they learn and acquire skills and ultimately earn higher wages. A good example and that, um, that I'd like to put up here is the, so is the Nordic labor markets. They're well regarded, they're very efficient, unemployment overall is low. Let's take the example of Sweden. There's no minimum wage, but there's a high entry level wage um, coming out of the wage negotiations of the social partners. It's well understood that this will have a, um, an impact on the chances of, of young people, of low skilled people, of immigrants to find a first job and keep it. So what we have argued is that this is an invitation for um, social partners to think about active labor market policies to, for skill building and other, and, uh, and, and other measures, including wage flexibility at the firm level. It is uh, interesting to note that it's, uh, both social partners in Sweden are interested in uh, the example of the German apprenticeship system um, here, because that delivers a little bit of both. I would like to know in general that it would seem that the countries which have labor markets that are performing well, even under dire circumstances, are countries where there is a lot of collaboration between social partners. Where labor markets work less smoothly than in such countries, other reforms may be needed. And what kind of reforms depends on the country, on the circumstances, there is not a recipe that works for all, but it's clear to us that there are some countries where duality, uh, asymmetric employment protection, very high for those with regular jobs, very low for countries uh, for purpose with temporary jobs, um, is, is a problem. In general, duality like this, extreme duality should be avoided. It leads to less skill investment, uh, which ultimately reduces productivity and enforces the cost of adjustment on those with temporary jobs. And that can often be the young. So in this case, I think there is a case to use the word for micro-flexibility. That's something that I've heard Olivier Blanchard uh, tell you and Prakash Rogani, who will speak a little later in the conference, I think tomorrow um, in the past. Sometimes, however, there's also a need for macro-flexibility. Most of the euro area countries that have suffered extreme current account deficits during the crisis have still a need to regain competitive, uh, competitiveness. Ideally, this is done through dynamic productivity growth. And if you have the right investment in skills coming out of the private sector with support of the governments, then that's what you will get. Where this is not enough, however, we have to think about wage adjustment relative to, um, relative to trading partners, which can be a more moderate wage growth. And I'm sure we're going to talk about this more, but where I stand, I think this is the main challenge for social partners going forward. I would like to end by talking a little bit about a broader measure of a broader view of, of structural form, and that is has to do with product markets and services sectors. I think this is a not often enough talked about source, very potent source of, of growth. And um, I think we need to um, think about uh, the, the scope for reform here, and that includes thinking about what uh, trade negotiations can do for us at this point. The, the, the research we and others have been doing, that the fund has been doing this well, shows us there is substantive room for growth. Uh, indeed, if you were to take in a virtual world all your area members and allow them to close 10 to 20 percent of the gap in terms of best practices in all these markets, services market, product markets, and labor markets, we would think that uh, this can give us a boost to GDP at the order of 3.5% by 2019. Now, that are numbers that are large compared to the kind of growth that we have seen currently, and unfortunately, which we will probably see a little bit going forward. 
So this is not a small feat. Let me summarize. I think that the way to more jobs is through growth. That has three elements of policies that we need to, uh, need to think about. One is in the short term. We need the continued support from fiscal monetary policy. Now it's easier for monetary policy and that needs to continue. We also should work on minimizing the cost of the lingering effects of the crisis, the financial repercussions that that overhangs. And I gave you a couple of examples of what can be done. And lastly, I think we need to continue to think about ways that we can jointly go uh, to improve the performance of labor market services and public markets um, in Europe. Thank you.